Welcome everybody this morning after that beautiful after that beautiful dinner last night it's hard to uh, come in and listen to science <laughs> this morning but I'm hoping you'll enjoy l listening a little bit to how nutrition during pregnancy and early development affects brain development in in uh, especially about a, a set of nutrients that you may not have been thinking about. I am, uh, first of all, want to thank the organizers for putting on a beautiful meeting that the organization has been spectacular. Thank you, Josiane, and everybody associated with it. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a nutrient called choline. Choline is a uh, required nutrient. I'll show you some data about that. Uh, there, what's very interesting about it is, is that the genetic polymorphisms in genes of choline and folate metabolism dramatically affect the human requirement for this nutrient and that becomes important because choline is important for fetal brain development. Choline sits at the crossroads in between uh, folate, methionine and choline metabolism. It donates a methyl group to homocysteine convert uh, through betaine con forming methionine and it is found in a wide variety of foods. The richest foods tend to be high in fat. Eggs and liver would be excellent sources. So those of you who ate the pate last night are thinking beautifully this morning. The um, intake of this nutrient is um, marginal. Uh, in the U.S. only uh, a few percent of uh, women of childbearing age uh, ingest more than the recommended amount of choline in the diet based on the U.S. recommendations. And um, in countries, uh, I've just finished a study in the Gambia, uh, like the Gambia, uh, choline intake is about a third as high as in the United States. So there may be large areas of the developing uh, world where choline intake may be low. Uh, in the Gambia, for instance, intake is about 150 milligrams a day, and in the U.S., uh, recommended intake is 450, and average intake is about 350 milligrams a day. Uh, the reason there has been a controversy as in the past as to whether you had to eat choline is, is that you have an enzymatic pathway for making phosphatidylcholine in your liver, and this pathway um, exists in everyone, but it's only active in young women. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, if we disturb folate metabolism, let's say here by um, a, a SNP in MTHFR, if we disturb folate metabolism, we see that choline pools in the liver drop markedly, and in the homozygote animal with a knockout for MTHFR, phosphocholine pools in the liver are about a quarter of what they would be in the wild type. If we block choline metabolism, we also see that folate levels drop because folate has to take up the slack, the, the extra work, when choline isn't there as a methyl donor. And when we take away choline, we see that S adenosyl methionine levels drop and S adenosyl homocysteine levels rise in tissues. So again, choline uh, is tightly interrelated to folate and methionine metabolism and in terms of methyl donation is one of the important nutrients regulating whether we have S adenosyl methionine available for doing methylation. Uh, later on we'll talk about DNA methylation. Uh, when we um, People have argued that the folate pathway is the most important pathway and that choline is just an ancillary uh, pathway, but that isn't likely to be true. If we knock out the gene BHMT, which is the gene that lets betaine derived from choline donate methyl groups, we see that homocysteine levels rise markedly in the animals. And the folate pathway, even when we give supplemental folate, isn't adequate to deal with the homocysteine loads. So this pathway is very important in modulating S adenosyl methionine uh, synthesis from methionine and homocysteine backbone. If we take choline away from people, they become uh, sick. And uh, we did a study in which we did that. And we found that almost all men and postmenopausal women became quite 
ill. They developed fatty liver and liver cell death, um, and about 10% developed muscle cell um, death with high CPKs. And that 10%, we've discovered that they have a, most of them have a SNP in the transporter for choline into the mitochondria, SLC44A. And then 44% of young women became sick, and obviously 56 could care less about eating choline. And that led us to look at why that is. And we found that the uh, gene, PEMT, responsible for making phosphatidylcholine in the liver has an estrogen response element that turns it on. And the women who became sick had a SNP in the estrogen response element that makes them unresponsive to estrogen. And um, this gene turns on in response to estrogen at just the concentration variation that occurs between premenopausal uh, women who are not pregnant and the end of pregnancy. So normally um, a woman has an estradiol concentration of, of under 10 and during pregnancy it rises up to um, 10 or 20 and so you can see the gene is turned on during pregnancy. So these 44% of women who got sick, it turns out, had a number of SNPs. One of the SNPs was in uh, the gene that's for, <coughs> pardon me, that's um, for uh, making choline from scratch, PEMT. They also, uh, some of them had SNPs in a gene in folate metabolism, uh, MTHFD1, and in a gene in choline metabolism, the conversion of choline to uh, betaine, choline dehydrogenase. Last year when I spoke at this meeting, I reported on choline dehydrogenase. When that gene is knocked out, mitochondrial function is completely lost in the mouse. Um, but in terms of the PEMP gene, women who um, have this SNP are unresponsive to estrogen. And here you see um, that if they're wild type P, if they are heterozygotes, they're somewhat responsive, and they're not responsive at all if they're homozygous for this SNP. And the interesting thing about that SNP is, is that uh, in the United States, Caucasian women, 72% have one allele for the SNP and 22% are homozygous. So this is not a rare SNP, and that accounts for why 44% of women require choline in their diet, even though they should uh, be able to turn it on with estrogen. They can't. Um, so we believe that it, it's important to, and when you're thinking about nutrition and metabolism, that we do more thinking about these common SNPs in metabolism that create metabolic inefficiencies because now we have a situation with responders and non-responders. Half of women don't have to eat choline if they're, when they're young. The other half do. Older women and men have to eat it all the time. And um, the difference in young women comes about because of a very common SNP. So as we think about pregnancy, it becomes important, again, to be thinking about what is the use of choline during pregnancy, and do the women who have this SNP, are they more likely to have a, a problem? Or do women who eat low choline and have the SNP have a problem, while people who eat very high choline diets don't care about the SNP because they provide their own from the diet? So what does choline do during pregnancy? Uh, it's interesting because uh, the placenta actively transports choline to the baby, creates a 15-fold concentration gradient between mother's blood and the baby, pumping it in. Uh, I told you that uh, during pregnancy, estrogen, uh, the gene for making choline, uh, phosphatidylcholine, is turned on by estrogen. And I'm going to now talk to you a little bit about what it does in fetal development. First of all, in, in human babies and in mice and in every mammal we've looked at, choline concentrations are very high in utero. They stay high during the period of breastfeeding, and then they drop down to adult levels as breastfeeding ends. And again, it's because breast mammary glands pump choline into breast milk, and breast milk is a rich source of choline for the baby. Colleagues of mine uh, at Duke University uh, looked at uh, why would uh, having choline during uh, development make a difference. And since they studied uh, hippocampal function, they measured the effects of choline on hippocampal function using radial arm mazes. And what they found was that um, during most periods of pregnancy, 
giving extra choline makes no difference. But if you give extra choline in the red during the t days 12 uh, to 17 of pregnancy, the <coughs> mouse has a 21-day pregnancy, the um, babies who are born from that and tested three months later as young uh, adult uh, rats uh, perform much better on radial maze testing. So uh, a normal Albert Einstein uh, rat could an empty a, a maze in 12 tries, 12 arms of food. A Duke rat normally takes 26 tries to empty the maze. But if they had choline in utero for five days during gestation, when they were three months old, they emptied it in 20 tries, or 30 percent improved memory function. And this could be replicated using uh, electrophysiological testing, looking for long-term potentiation, a lot of other areas of memory. And what's most interesting is, is that this lasts a lifetime, so that um, the animals born of mothers who had a little extra choline for five days during pregnancy, even as they aged, showed no loss of memory function, while the animals who were born of mothers who uh, had no extra choline during pregnancy showed memory loss as they aged. And mice die around three years of age, so this is a very old mouse at 26 and a half months of age. So perhaps um, when you go home and try to find your car in the parking lot at the airport and wander around, it's because your mother didn't take extra choline while you were a baby in utero. So early life events can have major implications in later life. So what we've gone on to look at is what's going on after that choline uh, administration in utero. And so here we're looking at the hippocampus in the 17-day fetus, uh, hippocampal brain, and slices of it. And um, what we're doing is marking cells undergoing mitosis, neural progenitor cells undergoing mitosis by staining for histone 3 phosphorylation. And we can count them. And the different regions of the hippocampus are marked in the graph. And any represents the summation of all the uh, neuroepithelial development regions. And the neurons are half less than half is uh, frequently dividing if the uh, mother had a low choline diet versus uh, in gray a control diet versus in black a uh, high choline diet. So we can more than uh, double the rate of neural progenitor cell proliferation by making choline available for five days during pregnancy. And again, we're measuring this on the end of that five-day treatment in the fetal hippocampus. And these cells in the hippocampus start at the edge of the ventricle. They undergo division, and then they migrate through the brain, um, eventually arriving at the location of the primordial hippocampus and colonize it, and then uh, are forming there. And um, here what we're looking at is in the brains from uh, fetuses whose mother had a deficient, a low choline diet, the number of cells um, undergoing mitosis in the uh, region that they were born is low, the region that they're migrating through is low, and the region in the uh, developing hippocampus that they're colonizing is low. If the mother's eating a control diet, we can see much more neural cell, uh, progenitor cell uh, proliferation, and we can see it's, in, it's going all the way through the migration and colonization of the hippocampus. And if they're on a higher choline, we can see that, again, we can further increase the numbers of neural progenitor cells. So we're not only increasing their division, but the numbers that end up colonizing the hippocampus and then setting up the wiring that will be where we store memory as we're, when we get older. This uh, increase in neurogenesis doesn't just last during fetal life when it's very active. But if uh, here's a, a, gr a group other than ours uh, who looked at adult brain neurogenesis in animals who got high, medium, or low choline in utero. And again, they report that they can still see an increased rate of neurogenesis occurring in the progenitor cells of the hippocampus at, in a 200-day-old animal. So, a fairly 
uh, adult animal in terms of the rat population. And again, a twofold difference between those born of a mother high in choline versus low in choline. In addition, many neurons die off during brain development by apoptotic mechanisms, and we could show that the rate of cell, neural progenitor cell death by apoptosis was twice as high as um, in, in low choline uh, babies versus high choline babies. Again, um, the nutrient being delivered for five days in utero um, and the effect being seen um, in the 17-day uh, fetal brain. So how does this occur? Something that lasts a lifetime. And one hypothesis is that it is epigenetic. And the reason to bring forward that hypothesis is, is that the um, sources of methyl groups uh, uh, in large part are derived from diet. So dietary folate methyl groups and dietary choline methyl groups are major sources of choline. And um, that the, uh, I talked to you earlier that the synthesis of s methionine depends on, on choline availability. So it's reasonable to think that you might be changing epigenetic marks. And um, a number of investigators have reported that um, they can in fact manipulate uh, the epigenetics in the baby by feeding the mother a diet high in choline, folate, and B12, methyl donors. And here you see a study by Waterland in which um, they had a nice marker mouse. Uh, this mouse has a bent tail when the gene acts infused is uh, not methylated. And when the gene acts infused is methylated and suppressed, the animal has a straight tail. And so by feeding the mother more methyl groups in the diet, they could directly change the phenotype of the offspring and have babies with straight tails or kinky tails. So being kinky appears to also uh, depend on your mother's dietary status. So um, again, we showed that um, you could change uh, ep uh, cell proliferation in the neural progenitor cells. And so we went and um, used laser capture microdissection on the fetal E17 brain, cut out the progenitor uh, proliferation region of the developing hippocampus, and took those slices, which you can see in C there, and looked at the epigenetic markings. And we could see that anim uh, the brains from a l fetus of a low choline mother have much less uh, methylation at uh, 38 different CPG islands in the gene CDKN3, which, uh, which um, <coughs> controls uh, cell proliferation. It's uh, a break. And animals born of mothers with normal choline diets had much more methylation, with methylation being indicated low in white, uh, medium in gray, and uh, heavily methylated in black. So that um, the Epigenetic marks are affecting the activity of CDKN3, which is the gene that codes for the RB protein and uh, breaks cell proliferation. When you methylate it, you suppress it, you stop the break, and you get more proliferation occurring. Um, this is not only limited in these brains to uh, neural progenitor cells. If we look at the progenitor cells that will form blood vessels and the thelial progenitor cells, again, uh, eating um, the mother eating a low choline diet results in fewer blood vessels forming in the developing hippocampus. And again, the um, explanation may be epigenetic because we can show that a number of the genes um, that are controlling uh, the uh, division of uh, endothelial progenitor cells uh, have um, differences in methylation in histones and in DNA. And um, here, two of those genes, angiopoietin 2 and VEGFC, um, are highly uh, methylated in um, the animals of mothers eating a higher choline diet and very undermethylated in the brains of the, the fetuses uh, 
eating a low choline diet. And we can see that that leads to a marked difference in the expression of these genes, and these genes then go on and control the uh, formation of blood vessels. And finally, we're just about to report that we can see a similar effect in the developing of the neurons in the retina, and that um, the uh, number of uh, neurons that develop and differentiate in each of the layers of the retina appears to be dramatically affected by maternal diet uh, and that the uh, baby's uh, eye development appears to also care about um, the um, availability of choline to the pregnant mother. Now, we don't know whether this occurs in humans uh, it should. The equivalent period in the human would be 25 weeks of gestation to uh, a year of age about. That would be the sensitive period in the rat uh, extrapolated to the same hippocampal development period in the human. So that means it would not only be pregnancy but early life nutrition. Uh, and breast milk, again, I'll remind you, is extremely high in choline. It wasn't until 2007 that infant formulas were normalized to try to match uh, choline uh, composition uh, with a human breast milk. So before 2007, some of the soy-based formulas had half as much choline as human breast milk. Uh, but in any event, in humans, um, there are uh, several nice epidemiologic studies out of California showing that the rate of uh, neural tube defects could, uh, was dramatically higher even after adjusting for folate in women who took in the lowest quartile of dietary choline intake versus in the highest quartile in a case control study. And they've gone on to report in another study in Berkeley, California that oral facial clefts, cleft palate, et cetera, are reduced in the women in the babies of women eating higher choline diets than lower choline diets. And again, this may be the same phenomenon as we're describing in brain, but now for the progenitor cells that are forming the, the palate. So the story I've told you is, is that there are a lot of nutrients that, um, especially choline, that can affect brain development and that um, it's probably important to make sure during pregnancy that you know whether you can make these nutrients de novo because you can turn on the gene for their synthesis with uh, estrogen or whether you have a genetic polymorphism that um, prevents you from being able to do that, then you need to have eggs and other things in your diet and be more careful. I would show you a movie, but I can't right here um, because they don't have sound, but uh, Star Trek had an episode uh, in which they uh, recognized that choline was important 400 years from now, in the year 2400. Um, and uh, if it's true for 400 years, it's worth remembering. You can't hear the sounds, so you can't hear them say, give these people choline, it's the only thing that'll save their brains. Um, and uh, I'll finish with uh, thanking uh, my postdocs and graduate students who did all, most of the work that I described to you today. Thank you very much. Can't be timing better than that. So um, the reason you can't is, is that when you give a methionine load, you generate a homocysteine as a product, and the homocysteine load inhibits the methylation. So what you do is you increase both S adenosyl homocysteine and S adenosyl methionine, which doesn't get you anywhere. With choline, you reduce the homocysteine. With folate, you reduce the homocysteine and S adenosyl homocysteine load, and you can handle it. Uh, where are you? Oh, thank you. Mice is very similar to the time window when germ cells get methylated, and a lot of it is genetics must have been identified. Do you find that your low choline mice have a fertility problem? Um, no. Um, the, the, we don't see in the low choline mice a fertility problem, but if we knock out the gene choline dehydrogenase, which converts choline to betaine and allows it to be a methyl donor, those animals are infertile if they're homozygous. Mm -hmm. 
Both male and female? Just male. The sperm can't move. They, that, their mitochondria in the sperm become unable to make ATP and their sperm are immobile. And if given betaine, you can restore mobility to the thing and restore mitochondrial function. So for those of you in mitochondria, I'd love an answer to why it's so important. Um, I have one question. How yes. does the deficiency of choline compare? Is, is it a severe or is it mild? How it compares to human populations? So in, in our animals, we gave them a diet that had 10% of the choline. In the human populations, as I said, in the Gambia, they have about 30% of the choline in their intake. I think the important thing is if you have, the, if you have a normal hemp gene, you can synthesize choline and you don't really care about your dietary intake very much. If you have a SNP in the hemp gene, then choline becomes important and um, the, that any level below what you require, you can't make up. And so it may well be that in the human it's important. And as you see in the California data, uh, the lowest quartile of intake was under 290 milligrams per day with the recommendation being 450. And they're already showing increased neural tube defects among the, the babies. So half is probably too little. Yes. yes. Given that uh, folate fortification is now uh, the general rule in the West, um, do you think that this reduces the need for uh, choline, that all that less choline that uh, a pregnant woman could get by with? And what would you think is the average recommendation, I shouldn't say average, what recommendation would you make for a pregnant woman in general to el eliminate these yeah. various uh, the genetic uh, problems. So the U.S. recommended adequate intake for pregnant women is 450 milligrams a day. But does that include those with a methylation defect? They didn't, yeah. we didn't consider that at the time because it wasn't realized it's there. But probably 450 milligrams a day is, will meet the, rec the need. Uh, it meets the need for men who can't make the nutrient at all, so probably it'll meet it. Uh, you know, 550 milligrams meets the requirements for men, but they're bigger than women. So and probably does folate reduce it at all? So folate should spare some of the requirement, but it doesn't replace it. In all of these mice, they have uh, more than adequate folate intake, and yet they still show the effect of reducing choline. So I would guess that um, folate may modestly reduce your requirement for choline, but doesn't replace all of it. You use choline to make membrane phosphatidylcholine. A huge amount of it gets eaten up for doing that, and the rest is used for making acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, and a little bit for methylation. Yes. 